I thought I knew every song in the book, but I uh, guess that one hadn't made the book yet. <laughs> Amen. Are you ready? I am ready to receive and obey the Word of God. How many of you know the Bible is full of proof of the return of the Lord? You know, I mentioned uh, 10 verses of the Old Testament that spoke of the return of Christ to earth. And, uh, of course, if we had talked about the millennial reign of Christ on earth, we'd have probably had three or four hundred verses that speak of that time. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness. Sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Thank God for all the good promises of God in the Old Testament about Christ's return. Thank God for all the many things that demonstrate us, the words of Jesus, the prophecies of Jesus. Thank God for his resurrection, bodily resurrection from the dead, proving to us that there is life after death and there is a resurrection. Thank God for his ascension. One of my favorite parts of the story of Christ is his ascension. While they watched him, he was taken up to heaven in a cloud and the angel's proclamation, this same Jesus whom you've seen go into heaven will so come in like manner as you've seen him go. That is going to be a glorious, glorious time. Thank God for proof, the proof of his return, his coming. And then prophecies. <clears throat> uh, I love the nature of biblical, true prophecy. Number one, it comes to pass. And this thing called the return of Jesus Christ, his physical return to this earth, that is a reality that will take place on the very planet that he created. Oh, how exciting is it to think about the return of the Lord and all the prophecies that are given that you and I see before our very eyes are coming to pass. Now, I, I had several pastors growing up, and particularly at our little church in Wellsville, but uh, uh, the reality is there are just certain pastors, uh, long-term pastors, who ha had a, an effect on my life. And, and I wish that I could bring the three of them here, and I wish I could have them stand before you and tell you, uh, as they look at this current world, that the very things that they preached decades ago are happening before your very eyes in a pace that they could have only dreamt of. We got a lot of preacher's kids in this church. I love our preacher's kids. And you were told at a very early age these things. They believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ to the earth, as do we. There's no one that believes more in the imminent return of Jesus Christ than I do. I don't care how many books are written on the subject or how many prophets emerge that say they know when he's coming. They don't. But I do know what I do know. I know that Jesus is coming again. And those pastors of mine and those pastors of yours in the past, if they were here today, they'd say, this is exactly what we were preaching. This is exactly what we believed. And it's coming to pass before your very eyes. How many of you excited about the return of the Lord? How many of you excited about the rapture of the church? Well, you know what? I got a feeling about that. And it's a new feeling. Because I've always been a little more excited about the rapture than I have about the return of the Lord. But today it's not so. Today I am much more excited about the return of the Lord to planet earth than I am about the rapture of the church. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, it really doesn't matter. The fact is, what matters is we're going. Two in the field, one taken, the other left. I'm excited about the rapture of the church. I hope it's tonight. Wouldn't that be glorious? We'll just all go together. In fact, I've always hoped and believed that the Lord would return on a Sunday night. I have. And some of the folks that stayed at home on the way up, they'll have to drop that TV remote and get rid of it on, on their way up. There are many promises. Not only are there proofs, not only are there prophecies, there are promises. And you can trust the Word of God. These promises will come to pass. When the scoffers and the doubters and even Christians say, where is the promise of His coming? 
All they're doing is inspiring doubt in what the Bible declares to be true. And they are also fulfilling prophecy. The Bible said in these last days, Paul writes to us that they're going to say this. Where is the promise of his coming? Well, they're saying it. They're fulfilling prophecy. So I want to talk to you tonight about seven promises from God's Word about Christ's return. And let me assure you, I'm excited about the rapture, but what really is going to count on planet Earth is when Jesus comes down and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. That's the change. That's the dramatic change that will happen. Luke chapter 21 is a companion chapter in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew 24, Luke 21, essentially relaying mostly the same information, but with, with some differences. And one of those difference, differences in the Gospel of Luke means the world to me. Luke 21 and 20, and when you shall see. You're going to see Jerusalem compassed with armies. We're not talking about 70 AD here. We're talking about a time to come. The very context and nature of Luke 21, Matthew 24, is a future coming of the Lord. The signs of the times and the end of the world was the question in Matthew 24. The disciples specifically ask, what is the sign, one sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus gave them an earful. Thank God we have it for us today to know that Jerusalem will be compassed about with armies. What's happening in Israel this very day, does it surprise you that this prophetic word will come to pass? It, it, it is so obvious to believers, true believers, that this very thing could happen. It could happen right now. When all the armies of the world, all the kings of the earth will gather together against that one nation. I mean, seriously, folks, the United States of America is hanging on by a thread in its support of the nation of Israel. Frankly, I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. But it's here. On the very streets and campuses of America, there are people that are shouting to the top of their lungs, death to Israel. These are serious times. And this is serious. These are serious signs of the time in which we live. I'll call it the last days. You will see Jerusalem compassed with armies. You know, he writes this almost 2,000 years ago. You will see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Was it fulfilled in A.D. 70? I suppose, but m most prophecies that I know of have dual fulfillments, then and now. And of course, we see that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them that are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of, help me, vengeance. You know, in the modern church, you don't hear anything about the vengeance of God. You don't hear anything about the anger of God. You don't hear anything about the judgment of God. But I'm telling you, when Jesus comes the second time, he's not coming as he did the first time. He's coming to reign and to rule and to destroy the wicked. Oh, that's such negative preaching. Call it what you want. It's truth. He's coming with vengeance. And all things that are written are going to be fulfilled. Woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be, and I want you to pay attention to these words, please. Great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Dear ones, you have lived in the most comfortable era of time the world has ever known. We are S-P-O-I-L-E-D in every way. We have all the luxuries that you could possibly imagine. 
We have the technologies. We have, well, let's face it, six million dollar man would now be a six billion dollar man, but we have the power to fix it. I don't even want to ask how many of you have had parts replaced in your bodies. I know I had one. <laughs> knees and shoulders and ankles and hearts. <laughs> what an age. What an age do we live in, the technological age. Hey, Siri, what's the weather? I'm just checking to see if your phone is on. Uh, we call it Echo at our house instead of Alexa because every time the TV says Alexa, Alexa does something. And... Uh, Echo, play this little light of mine. And this little light of mine comes on. Along with advertisements about the record you can buy that has this little light of mine on it, right? What an, what an age of comfort we live in. My, 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 my. I was so happy the day mom let me have a black and white TV in my bedroom. With rabbit ears. And yet I can get information all around the world at the drop of, well, at the push of a button or a voice command. And that is just beginning. And yet with all of these comforts, there is a greater distress in the world today than we could possibly describe in this message. There is tremendous distress and yoga won't solve it. You can shout amen, that's true. That uh, comfort animal won't solve it. Drugs and alcohol won't solve it. Legalization of pot won't solve it. You name it, it won't solve it. Psychiatrists can't solve it. There is a great distress in the land, and there will also be upon his own chosen people a wrath, a wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led captive to all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. You get a little sense of 70 A.D. and following there. I love verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Would you say that, please? Sun, moon, and stars. And so I preach it often. Wait till God goes messing with the sun, moon, and stars. You thought global cooling was an issue. You thought global warming was an issue. You thought climate change was an issue. Wait till he goes messing with the sun, moon, and the star. Then you know it's getting serious. It's getting serious. Enjoy your electric car. <laughs> and upon the earth, the first description of distress was about Jerusalem, about his own people. But the next description is upon the entire earth, upon the earth, distress of nations, plural, with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Do we look back far enough to remember that great tsunami that swept across the Pacific? Just a touch of what is to come on planet Earth. Say, so, well, there's only one judgment of God by water, and that was in the days of Noah. Evidently, there's a little more water coming. The seas and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. I always thought that my heart failed me for cookies, but it wasn't even that. It was electrical. My dad is an electrician. I had an electric problem in my heart. I needed a new heart. So cookies weren't the problem. But fear and distress are a problem. And the nations, not just individuals, the nations are going to experience this. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. What's coming upon planet Earth? 
They're looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And this is greater than all that I've mentioned thus far, that the powers of heaven will be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. I'd like for you to notice in your notes that under the word in verse 27, then, I underlined it. And in verse 28, the word when is underlined. Then and when. When these previous signs have happened, then shall they, uh-oh, they're going to see him. Tell your neighbor, they're going to see him. What does see mean? It means they're going to see him. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Every time I see an exciting cloud in the east, I get excited. Boy, Lord, you're an artist. You are such an artist. Every time I see a sunset, I say, Lord, you're an artist. What an artist you are. Amazing. Just inspires my heart to worship him, his great creation. But, friends, the rapture of the church all around this entire world, not a 24-hour cycle, but all around this world in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the church can be gone. Boy, the old-timers would shout glory, but you guys won't do it. Uh, the old-timers would wave a hanky and stand up and preach it, brother. The rapture of the church comes suddenly, unexpectedly, as a thief in the night. But the physical, visible return of Jesus Christ to this earth will be seen. So cover that, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Cover that one. Hmm. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and with great glory. This same Jesus whom you've seen go into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Jesus is coming again, and he's coming in a cloud, Shekinah. He's coming in a glory of God the world has never seen before. Mm. Then you shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things, this is interesting to me, when they begin to come to pass. There's a lot of fulfillment in Scripture going to happen. And it's going to happen in a big time hurry. When these things begin to come to pass, now, before I say the next words, of all the promises of God about his return, absolutely this one is the most special and important to me. It's more important to me than the rapture of the church. It's the return of Christ to this earth is so much more important than the rapture that we're all caught up in all the time. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I, I wish the Lord would have three raptures. And then guys like me, uh, we'll go on the first one. And guys like some of my friends, they'll go on the middle one. And... Uh, all the professors at seminaries, if they're saved, go on the last one. Did I say seminary or cemetery? I'm not sure. Um, when these things begin to come to pass, look up! Lift up your hands! Your redemption draweth nigh. Your redemption draws nigh, brother. Sister, your redemption is drawing nigh. Children, your redemption is drawing nigh. And so this old weary world with all its toils and struggles, they're not going to matter a bit to us when King Jesus comes to live with us again. Well, that's the first of seven points. Is there anything more important than 
that redemption drawing nigh, I can't think of any, but this comes pretty close. Speaks of our eternity. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is speaking. In my Father's house. He didn't say in my house. He said in my Father's house. Are many mansions. Newer uh, versions of Scripture might say dwelling places. You keep your dwelling place. I want my mansion. So does Ira Stanfill, who wrote the great song. In my Father's house are many mansions, plural. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I go. What is the reason he left planet Earth? Well, partially this. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Say it, please. I will come again. Say it again. I will come again. That's a promise. And receive you individually. I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. You know, it's almost every believer's interment service at, after the funeral we go to bury them and almost every time if I know it's a believer I will use John 14 1 through 3 oh just build my mansion next door to Jesus tell the angels I'm coming home oh I will come and receive you into myself that where I am there you may be also the separation that death brings to us in our humanity will come to an end and there will be no more sorrow no more weeping no more mourning no more tears we will be in the presence of Jesus forever number three <clears throat> we've talked about it morning and evening already when Jesus had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up that's a pretty interesting word to me taken up for those that don't believe in the rapture of the church, well, how did Jesus leave? He was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, I illustrated for you this morning what that looked like. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. If he can go that way, he can come back this way, and he will. And all the military might, all the armies of this world, won't have an answer for that. When King Jesus comes... To live with us again. Titus 2, through, uh, 11 through 15. Generally we just talk about verse 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation. How many of you are thankful for that grace that brought you salvation? Hath appeared to some. No, it has appeared to all men. Friends, they are without excuse. Just by creation itself, they're without excuse. But considering this gospel that has been preached around the world, this salvation has appeared to all men. Some will receive it, some will reject it, but friends, it has appeared to all men. The name Jesus is known throughout the world. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, boy, there's plenty of that out there, isn't there? We should live soberly, circumspectly, cautiously, soberly, righteously, and godly when? In this present world. Well, you know, I mean, that's Paul writing to Titus centuries ago. And he's talking about this present world. Well, there's nothing new under the sun, folks. It's still this present world. There's really nothing new under the sun. And here's the promise. Looking. That verb just keeps ringing out in the Greek all the time. Every, every page on the New Testament, it just leaps out at you. Look and keep on looking. 
looking, anticipating, expecting that blessed hope. How many of you know we have hope today? The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. Eat your heart out, Star Wars. There's a better answer and a better day. The glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All iniquity. All, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Aren't you glad you're a peculiar people? Zealous of good works. These things speak. We are. And exhort. We are. And rebuke with all what? Authority. Authority. See, we're not speaking like, um, well, this is a theory. We're speaking with the authority of Scripture, the very words of Jesus, and the words of the apostles. We're speaking with God's authority. Jesus is coming again. And we're to preach it. And so woe to any preacher that stops preaching it. Where is the promise of his coming? Woe to them. We're instructed to speak, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. And by the way, let no man despise thee. I don't know about you, but I don't mind they think that I'm peculiar. I'm dumb enough to think that that's a compliment. Because there's all this talk and all these movies and all these books and everything about aliens, 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 aliens. And they're looking and they're searching and they're trying to find the aliens and here I am! I am not of this world! You are not of this world! We're foreigners, strangers, pilgrims, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. So let no man despise thee. What does it matter what they think of you as long as what you've said comes to pass? In fact, watchmen, basically pointing my finger at myself, watchmen, their blood is on your hands. Ezekiel makes it clear. The, the blood is on the hands of the watchmen if they don't warn the approach of the enemy. I love this. Last week, my sister sent a... Uh, video of my dad talking about this love that built a bridge, talking about redemption in Calvary. Probably a song lyric knowing my dad, but anyway, in his advanced years and pretty near death, he quotes this entire thing. And it was very moving, it was very touching, but uh, this verse above all others reminds me of my dad, because he got all over me one time. What do you mean, Dad? You're getting all over me. I'm an ordained Assemblies God preacher with 35 years experience. But I made a mistake. I know, Esther, that surprises you that I made a mistake, but I made a mistake. I said these words in front of my dad. I said, um, unless the Lord tarries his coming, My dad said, whoa, 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 no, 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 don't say it. Why not? And he pointed his non-preacher finger at me, said, he who shall come will come and will not tarry. And my dad didn't spend one day in Bible college. What a waste of money. If that's what the book says, Hebrews chapter 10. He said in verse 34 that we know in ourselves that we have in heaven 
a better and enduring substance. How many of you know heaven's better? Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of what? Reward. There's a reward. You have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive a promise? No. The promise. Say it with me. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. I'm going to skip one point and then come back to it as our close. He who shall come will come and will not tarry speaks of the quickly he will appear. You say, well, it's been 2,000 years. How much longer is he going to tarry? Well, that's not what it means. When he comes, he's coming in a twinkling of an eye. And then when he returns to planet Earth, every eye is going to see him. You know, the old scoffers, they used to scoff at that, but in the age of television and Internet, they don't scoff at it anymore. This thing could be seen around the world easily. But speaking of this not tarrying, we find these verses in Revelation 3 and 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to that which you have. And let no man take thy crown. Evidently, you can lose your crown. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Revelation 22 and 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. There are many people who are not keeping the prophecies of this book. They're false shepherds, false prophets, false teachers. Revelation 22 and 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my what? My reward is with me to give every man according to as his work shall be. There's a reward coming. Revelation 22 and 20, he which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. He didn't say behold that time, but same message. Surely I come quickly, amen, even so. Come, Lord Jesus. That ought to be your prayer and mine every day. We should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We should pray that the time should be shortened. And we should pray even so. John the Revelator, after seeing all the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials, said, even so, Lord Jesus, come. That should be our heart's desire. When he comes, he'll come quickly. Now, I don't know if this happened or not, but it's been told in every pulpit, probably in every Pentecostal pulpit in America, the preacher was real excited, evangelist, whatever he was, and the pulpit was this high, and the people are sitting down there, and what have you, and he says, behold, I come quickly. He got real excited. He had one of those old-fashioned microphones with a cord on it, you remember? <laughs> old-fashioned cord. And you know, evangelist, he can whip that thing around, you know, and grab you by the neck and pull you to the altar. <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. And over and over again, he said, Behold, I come quickly. And finally, he tripped on the thing and landed right there on the front row in some lady's lap. <laughs> He felt really embarrassed in every way. He's so sorry. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the lady said, don't worry about it, preacher. You told me three times you were coming quickly. <laughs> I'm sure that's fiction, but it's a story before we finish this message. Back up one point. Behold, he cometh with clouds. See, it isn't just two angels, two men in white apparel who announce at his ascension that he's coming in the clouds. It's also found in the revelation of Jesus Christ as John the Revelator brings this reality to us in chapter 1. Of course, every time I got to go to Revelation, I got to tell you two things about Revelation. Number one, it's not two or three or 10 or 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, or 1,000 revelations. It's one. Doesn't say, look on the title in your Bible. Doesn't say revelations. You still say it, and I still keep telling you don't do it, but you do it anyway. It's one revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation. Mm. Mm. 
It's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's not the revelation of the mark of the beast. It's not the revelation of the seven seals. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1 and 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds. I hope you get that. You'll never be led astray by a false Christ as long as you know the real one's coming in the clouds. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and people read this, they know it's in there, but it just doesn't somehow take hold. But let it take hold tonight. That every eye shall see him. Exactly what Jesus said to Caiaphas and the religious of his day that were crucifying him, going to have him crucified. He said, you're going to see the Son of Man. You're going to see him. Those that pierced him. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Not only that, friends. And all, say all, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And the way he ended the revelation is how he starts it here when he says, even so. Amen. What is the revelation of Jesus here? It is I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come. Who is he? He's the Almighty. King of kings and Lord of lords. And he is coming soon. Hallelujah. Live 